to introduce Dr. Leo Polpa. He is um, chair of the Department of Biology at SUNY ESF. He's um, the author of an excellent book on uh, native species um, in our landscapes in, in the Northeast. And um, I, I don't want to go uh, further into it, but he has um, a length of attributes, an arm's length of attributes that um, I could go on for quite a while. So I will not do that. I will just now introduce um, and welcome Don Leopold. Thank you very much. And everybody, please push your mute buttons. Thank you. All right, great. Thanks for inviting me. Uh, so are we, Leslie, are we taking questions along the way? How does that work? Um, However you would like to do it, Don. I'm happy to be interrupted along the way. There's a lot of slides, but we don't need to dwell on any one. Hey, um, this, this is this your part. time. We ordinarily have a partner's update at the end, but um, I'm willing to um, you know, go on through that, that time right up to noon, unless there's something really, um, really, really important from our, either our database or clearinghouse partners. So um, time is yours, Don. Welcome. Okay. Uh, so I've been giving a lot of talks around the uh, Northeast and Midwest on native species, and more recently putting native species in groupings that represent natural communities, <laughs> common natural communities, and really odd ones. So, for example, we're thinking about using the uh, Alvar um, structure and pattern and composition as a template for some green roof designs that we're applying to a new building on our campus. But uh, Leslie asked me to, to sort of start at a real basic level about native species. If you're familiar with my book, it I think there's something like 700 and something species in there. We're just going to look at a few of those, and I've grouped them by uh, challenging site conditions because land people who want to plant, whether they're native or not, they typically want to know what do I do for the sun or for the shade or for wet soils or for really dry soils. And the neat thing about natives is an easy sell is that if you've got a site that has any kind of difficult conditions, it, those of us who spend all our lives out in the in natural communities know that there's an array of really beautiful species well suited. And, and people are often surprised to find out that they're native. They already know these species, but didn't that didn't really know they were native to New York necessarily. So uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going through three groups of species. If there's questions along the way at any time, let me know. But just an example of, of a species that's native, like eastern cottonwood, that grows under just pretty extreme conditions naturally on dunes and in on floodplains and coming up here by the, the carrier dome by a, uh, I mean, there's no, no soil within a mile of there. So it wouldn't necessarily be a species you'd recommend for a, a lot of settings, for example, for street tree plantings, but for restoration purposes, especially if the, if the conditions are extreme, you can't really find a more um, valuable species. So I'm gonna go into the three groups of species, starting with wet, and here's sort of the extreme wet, and this is, isn't even in New York, but it just gives you an example of so many species that are well adapted to really some extreme conditions. Now the neat thing about doing it this way is that if you don't have wet conditions, for example, this is bald cypress, I'm gonna mention it later, not native to New York, but if you, so if you have anything that's better than wet conditions, these species will do a lot better, but they're very well adapted to the extremes. So I'm just gonna highlight a few species and what you'll see, you're gonna see some, uh, you'll see names, common names and scientific names, and uh, if you have questions, about these suggestions along the way. But just a quick overview of some of the natural wet sites in New York State over at Labrador Hollow. And they're just packed with many native species, some of which are regularly used in the landscape, like red maple, and some of which are, are less commonly used. So what I'm gonna do in each of these is start off like my book is organized. It goes through the ferns and then the grasses or graminoid-like plants, uh, occasional vines, uh, or wildflowers, vines, shrubs and trees. And so these are species that are native to these very wet conditions in New York. For example, the ostrich fern, a beautiful five foot, no, four foot tall fern along many creek and river floodplains. It's also the most delicious of all the, the fiddleheads. Um, and now I've not been asked to talk about state protected plants. I, I give a lot of presentations on state protected plants. All ferns in New York State are state protected except for three. And this is one of the many legal protection, but it's not rare, it's just uh, protected because of its vulnerability. So here it is in the landscape, it's actually the picture on the upper right here, or upper left is in my backyard, so not a floodplain, my soils are very, I don't do anything special, I think gardening should not be a lot of work and people sometimes make it too difficult. 
And here it is in front of a, of a house that's real sunny exposure. And so some of these ferns, what they actually do is they change appearance, color, and height based on if you cite them out of their typical habitat. So ostrich fern in the sun gets to be a more robust, shorter fern, and in the shade becomes a softer green and, and actually a, a taller plant. So the, it's fun to use these ferns because you can have one species in three different landscape settings, and the most observers will think it's three different species when in fact it's only one. A cinnamon fern, a real common fern that can be used on wet sites. Here it is up in a Oswego swamp in the winter, about the same time a few years ago. Beautiful when the fronds emerge. So ferns are often thought of as other oh, just boring green, but my gosh, they have really neat appearance in the winter, in the spring, in the summer, and, and in this case, even in the fall. So here it is mixed in with the royal fern in a, one of our red maple swamps north of Syracuse. Uh, the more sun you give it, the shorter the fronds are and the more compact the plant is. Doesn't have to be standing in water, but does very well doing so. Royal fern, another Osmunda, uh, all state protected, found in even the wetter conditions. And here's, people don't think of ferns as having nice fall color, but beautiful bronze fall color on the cinnamon fern of a beaver lake. All right, so people often say, well, you know, what if I got wet soils? Well, this is kind of a wet soil. It's about a foot of standing water. And here's this marsh fern doing so well. And now I've planted this throughout my garden near Syracuse here. And it, it's not in any standing water. It's in well-drained sites, and it spreads out all over by a really shallow rhizome. But it's it's not invasive. And it's it's not hard to control. But it's really a wonderful small fern for the garden. Sun, shade, wet, dry. All right, so a couple of the grasses or grass-like plants, in this case the juncus, the soft rush. It's actually very one of the widest uh, distribution of any graminoids in the world. Uh, Carex, there are about 204 Carexes in New York State, and uh, m many of them in wetlands, not all, but a really nice group of plants for wet sites. Uh, beautiful when they're emerging in the spring. Here in standing water, doesn't have to be. Really interesting looking in the winter. So uh, the grasses in particular have some really nice winter features. All right, some of the wildflowers, swamp milkweed, marsh marigold, turtle head, Joe pie weed. And I'm not mentioning all the attributes of some of these species. For example, the Joe pie weed, if you're also interested in maximizing uh, butterfly species, this is one of the very best. It's just really a great butterfly magnet, as many members of the Astra family are. Here it is growing at Cornell Plantations in a very well-drained setting. It's about eight feet high there. So it doesn't have to be standing in water to do very well. A rose mallow, the hibiscus that's native, the variety that's pink, and the straight species white. <laughs> the uh, blue flag, uh, blue flags are, there's actually quite a bit of color variation. And so this issue of native plants, the question typically comes up about varieties. You know, if the varieties are, are not due to hybridization, then uh, they should be considered as worthy native of gardens. Um, we've seen a lot of color variation in, in blue flag and would like to get some of these out, uh, propagated and out uh, for the public to use. Cardinal flower, a really nice native plant here standing in water on the left. Another one that's exceptional for butterflies and for hummingbirds in particular. Skunk cabbage. Now, so you probably wouldn't plant this for the, um, for the flowers because some would argue that they're probably ugly. But they're interesting because they come out in late March here and they melt the snow and ice around them and they get all kinds of neat flies to pollinate them. But the foliage is really striking. It's a little bit of Veratrum verde in here, uh, the Indian poke, but most of this is skunk cabbage. Apparently Steve Young has told me that uh, there's a, he's found a variegated one over in a swamp near Rochester. And it's one of those things we'd like to someday go back and see if we could propagate it because maybe this is the, the hosta of uh, wetlands. Um, about 30,000 hostas that are known cultivars and, and skunk cabbage and some of these other native species. There could be some interesting natural varieties out there. All right, so some of the shrubs, starting with the red chokeberry. So I did not mention about the native, defining native. So red chokeberry, you know, people in Onondaga County in central New York could argue that, well, it's not native. And they're right, because as you know, uh, any folks from downstate are in the conversation here. It's a downstate species around the coastal plain ponds. 
So there's the issue of is it native to a state? I mean, blue spruce, Colorado spruce, people have argued at some of my presentations it's native. Well, yes, it is native to four western states, but western states, uh, not native at all in New York. Uh, Norway spruce, naturalized in New York, but not native. So the definition of native is important to, to get on the table early on so people aren't arguing about um, things. Now, my, my brother works for the uh, Northern Kentucky University for their Applied Center of Ecology, and they do all of their restoration projects. They try to work with propagules collected from within a watershed. They're really strict about this native category. Um, what I've been trying to tell people is, you know, be aware of the New York State natives, and if it's downstate, don't feel guilty about using it upstate and vice versa. Uh, button bush. So these are all great plants for wet sites, and yet here, this picture of it in flowers from a upland garden, very dry setting. Summer sweet clethra from downstate does very well upstate. Great for hummingbirds and butterflies. Redwood dogwood. A winter berry. We've got a, quite a bit of, of this on our campus in really well-drained settings. It doesn't have to stand in water, but if you've got it, uh, there's few shrubs that are more colorful in the winter. It's also state protected, as is northern bayberry. The swamp azalea. So swamp azalea native to Long Island, uh, the, what used to be a lot of the Atlantic white cedar swamps, but um, it does grow its own for grows very well in upstate New York. About 40 willows that are uh, native or naturalized in New York State. Uh, most are sort of shrubby. This one is sort of a, a small tree, the shining willow, and the black elderberry. So not only beautiful flowers and uh, good wildlife habitat, but excellent uh, fruit for pies and jams. Viburnum casanoides, the wide rod, and not as susceptible to the uh, leaf beetle as some of the other uh, viburnums are. Some of the trees for real wet sites, some of these are very well known already. Downstate New York, the river birch, Betula and Niagara, a lot of interesting uh, cultivars. Uh, doesn't have the pest problems that the paper birch has, much more tolerant of, of warm. It's actually a more southern species. This is actually native not far from my office here. It's um, at the south end of Owasco Lake. There's only one population that I know of in the state of the shell bark hickory. So it looks like shag bark. It lives for three, four hundred years but the fruits are actually the size of a tennis ball. It's also called uh, king nut. Uh, beautiful seven leaf, seven leaflets, uh, really striking tree uh, for some purposes. Organic white cedar, downstate New York, grows in very saturated organic soils. Sweet gum, sweet bay magnolia, Black gum, common in our swamps around central New York. It's also found on very dry sites. So a lot of these species that are found in wetlands, like red maple, are also found on the driest sites. Swamp white oak here, it is in Central Park. Uh, it's the oldest tree in Syracuse. There's uh, one about 380 years old on Erie Boulevard, uh, the only plant left from the great swamp that extended from Onondaga Lake up to Shopping Town Mall. It's, uh, really a striking specimen, really takes about any kind of conditions, uh, saline, wet, dry. A pin oak, another one that despite the name, palustrous, meaning swamps, it actually tolerates extreme dryness as well. All right, so when I just thrown in just a few of these. So there's some additional species that uh, they're not native to New York, so we have to define what native is, but they're native to the east, and we should at least be aware of some of these. For example, the northern sea oats is a really nice floodplain grass that tolerates ex extremely shady conditions as well as wet. Uh, the yellow root. The, uh, so there's lots of wisterias, and typically the species chinensis, the Chinese wisteria, is planted, but our American, our native wisteria, which is the floodplain wisteria, is really a spectacular plant, beautiful purple flowers. Uh, Virginia sweet spire creeps up into New Jersey, really nice for summer flowers and fall color that rivals the burning bush and the bald cypress. So here's a tree that will live for 2,000 years in 10 feet of water. It's about as flood tolerant as anything in North America except for mangroves in the southern United States. All right, so that's the wet category. I guess two more categories, dry and sunny and, uh, and shady. So here's a pitch pine and the gunks, some of the trees up to 400 years old, growing on extremely dry conditions. 
And the, if you haven't been up to the Alvar northwest of Watertown, an example of some pretty extreme, mostly rock, a half an inch of soil, and in this case, some sedum acre, not native in here, but a lot of mostly native plant species. All right, so columbine, wild columbine, Aquilegia canadensis. So some of the, the arguments against some of these natives is that columbines have such beautiful colors when you look at the European hybrids and the Western hybrids. But um, so this one, you know, doesn't have a great color range. There is a yellow, there are yellow varieties. But it's a very nice, uh, the hummingbirds hit it about May 15th when it just starts to bloom and they're migrating through butterfly weed, state protected, uh, really wonderful plant for providing nectar and the food source for monarchs. Discovered in New York State just in 1981 up in the Chameau Barrens area, but the prairie smoke is really a great plant, both in flower and in fruit for dry sites. Blue lupin, uh, really one of the most beautiful plants over in the uh, Albany pine bush up through Lake George area, um, lives for decades compared to the European hybrid that is commonly planted. This, this primary food source for um, nectar for the first brood of Carner Blue and very important for uh, the larva uh, of Carner Blue. It's the only larval food plant for the Carner Blue butterfly federally listed. And here's the Connor blue butterfly in these shots here. Actually on a very serious invasive uh, spotted knapweed. Uh, Eastern prickly pear is uh, native to the lower Hudson and it's uh, growing in my garden in Syracuse on a bunch of rocks that I threw in the backyard to, to give it something that looked like it's home. But it really thrives upstate New York and elsewhere. Beautiful in flower in July. There it is in flower, usually about July 1st in my garden. Uh, everyone knows about the creeping phlox, phlox subulata, that's actually native to serpentine areas in um, Pennsylvania and native to New York, but very well suited straight species and the varieties to dry and sunny. Here's the straight species in flower. Actually in Kentucky, the zebra swallowtail sort of gives away that's not New York probably. Some of the shrubs for the hottest and the driest areas, the bearberry, here it is growing on basically pure sand and quartz on the New Jersey pine barrens. Beautiful in flower, foliage, interesting fruit, evergreen. New Jersey tea, a nitrogen fixer, really a wonderful nectar species. Sweet fern, a nitrogen fixer, looks kind of like a fern, but it's actually a shrub. One that is not well known, but it's very common in central New York, and we're propagating it, hoping to get it out on the market is the round leaf dogwood. So it has a more subtle stem color than red twig. It has more of a coral to green in the winter and nice white flowers than the, than the late spring. Good fall color and sort of a bluish uh, fruit. And here it is growing on the limestone quarries near Syracuse and probably not within a half a mile of any soil. Black huckleberry, delicious tasting fruit, nice fall color. Uh, I think it's still an S2 uh, heritage element in New York State, Western New York, the shrubby St. John's work, really a nice plant for droughty conditions. Okay, I'm clicking and Click, oh, okay. The uh, horizontal juniper, we know this from a lot of horticultural varieties like Bar Harbor and Wilton, but out at Virgin Swamp is the only place in all of New York State, just southwest of Rochester, where the horizontal juniper, so here it is in the main picture here, growing on these raw marls. They're a pH of eight, they're saturated. These are some of the very worst growing conditions anywhere. And here's, it sort of explains why it does so well on walls and other types of landscape settings, so horizontal juniper. Mountain laurel, state protected, great for dry, sunny sites. Northern bayberry, which I've already mentioned for wet, it occurs in our calcareous fens in central New York, but on Long Island it's on the dunes, so it really covers the wide range of very wet to very dry. Sand cherry up on Lake Ontario, this is our variety, the variety of depressa, fairly rare up there. Scrub oak, 
another one that really I wish people would start to propagate this and make it more available. It is a beautiful little shrub that's indestructible. Looks like poison ivy. It's uh, related. The fragrant sumac grows on the Alvar areas up in uh, Watertown. Some really nice horticultural varieties that are very glossy foliage. Good looking fruit, although you wouldn't want to eat it. Wing sumac, beautiful in fall color and fruit. The uh, females, it's dioecious. Low bush blueberry, for real dry, hot site. Prickly ash. All right, and then some trees that are found naturally on these types of sites and also would do well on dry, sunny sites. The, the Raelia spinosa, the devil's walking stick, gray birch, mocker nut hickory, which is over in the Finger Lakes region. Beautiful fall color on all the hickories. The uh, hawthorns. Nice group of native trees with beautiful white flowers and attractive fruits. They do have a thorn. If you're looking for a natural hedge, it's a very nice hedge. Eastern red cedar, many horticultural varieties, some that are even more shrub-like with different colors. But these are all naturally, they've all been discovered under from natural populations. They're not hybridized from other species. Pitch pine. Virginia pine, one of the rarest trees in all of New York State. I think it's either an S1 now or an SX. I think it's an S1. Um, grows very well up in Syracuse. It will grow anywhere in New York State and really tolerates extreme drought. Pin cherry, here it is at the Chimney Bluffs up on uh, Lake Ontario where the drumlins have been eroded and uh, there's no soil anywhere here. It's just bone dry and beautiful in flower, fall color, and fruit. Scarlet oak, Finger Lake species, and uh, there's southern red oak on here. It does not come into New York. It uh, comes up into central New Jersey, but it does grow very well here. Great non-native to New York tree for dry sites. Bur oak, though, native to New York. Chestnut oak, native to New York. Great for dry sites. Not moving along for some reason here. So, sassafras can be a small, scrawny tree, or it can be a pretty big tree, depending on how good the site conditions are. And uh, the viburnum called the black hall, viburnum prunifolium. It sort of looks like Lentago or um, nanny berry, but very well suited to dry sites. And just a few that are not native to New York, they're native to the east, great for really dry conditions. The fringe tree, so here it is growing on. If you've ever been down to the Atlanta area, there's these big domes of granite, and that's where I first saw a fringe tree. Uh, just a spectacular shrub and flower, and it's in the olive family. Interesting olive-like fruit. And uh, yucca, not native to New York, but native to the Mid-Atlantic region, and again occurs on nothing but rock outcrops. So we'll tolerate anything like that or better in the landscape. Sourwood, here it is in the, along the streets in Cambridge, Massachusetts, where it gets hammered with really bad conditions. It's probably 100 years old, beautiful in fall color and in flower. The sourwood in the Ericaceae, the Heath family. And shingle oak, which is a real common Midwestern oak, and really a neat looking oak for street tree plantings, very drought tolerant. All right, and then some species that tolerate really deep shade because they're part of a uh, mature forest or in the understory. Hart's tongue fern, uh, a plant that we've been working with for many years, about 92% of the U.S. population uh, out at Clark Reservation, about five miles from my office here. Really does well in extremely dense shade. But there are a lot of other ferns that thrive in shade, although not all ferns do, but the maidenhair fern and the lady fern, really indestructible. If you can't grow these, you know, you really can't grow anything. Uh, there's a, a lot of hedges that occur in uplands, and this one is, none of these have really good common names because they're not that commonly known by the average person, but uh, the, it's sometimes called the blue sedge, Carex platyphylla, very common in central New York. 
really beautiful ribbon-like crinkled leaves that are bluish. Wild ginger, neat flowers, although you have to peel the leaves back to see them. Oh, there they are. The black snake root on the real shady, rich sites, uh, semi-suffuga racemosa, about five feet high flower stalks. Twin leaf, it's an S2, I think, still in New York State, um, found on calcareous shaded slopes. Beautiful and full of uh, flowers last about an hour or two, but the foliage is there all, all growing season. And blood roots stay protected. Flowers don't last long, but the foliage is so attractive. Waiting for this to advance. We think of goldenrods as sort of old field, uh, bright light species, but there are some really nice understory goldenrods, the blue stem goldenrod, Solidago casea, and the uh, Solidago flexicollis, the zigzag goldenrod, which I don't have a picture of here. Foam flower, nice carpet of beautiful foliage and flowers. why this is not advancing. Uh, some of the shrubs. Bush honeysuckle, nice fall color and attractive but small flowers. Leatherwood, one of the most, um, it's not actually a heritage element, but it's not that common. Uh, Durca palustris found in swamps and also found on dry outcrops, but typically in dense shade. Witch hazel, our native witch hazel, Hemimellus virginiana. Blooms in uh, October. Uh, this one, I'm not even sure if it's if it's in or out of the state. Uh, historically, it was known from New York State, the smooth hydrangea. There are many horticultural varieties like hills of snow here, but this is what it looks like in its native condition. Um, I think it's either an S1 or an S2. H, but uh, it is a New York State native, although it may not be known currently in New York State. Spice bush, very common in New York State, beautiful fall color, early spring flowers, and a nice fruit display later in the year. Very important source for the spice bush swallowtail. Also, uh, not that, that common in the state, western New York, the flame azalea. And over in Utica, there's a big swamp of Rose Bay rhododendron and rhododendron maximum, about 30 feet high, beautiful summer flowers, evergreen. This is one of, I think, the least appreciated of the shade uh, type native plants. Um, beautiful arching stems that exfoliate and nice big pink flowers and a fruit that sometimes is delicious and a real bold leaf, the flowering raspberry. Bladdernut. Interesting bark, fruit, and flowers. Maple leaf viburnum, really nice flowers in the spring and a good fall color. It's about knee to about waist high. Nice little plant for deep shade. And then some of the trees for shade, they're typically going to be these understory subcanopy trees like the service berry. You can't find many trees that have nice flowers, fruit, fall color, form, bark. This has it all. The pawpaw, native to the uh, area around south or west of Rochester, uh, beautiful flowers in mid-May. These are all for my garden. I get about 10 to 20 pounds of fruit every year. Great fall color, beautiful pyramidal form. This is one of the most perfect trees in the world, and it's just amazing how many people haven't heard of it and don't ever use it. American hornbeam, the carpinus, it's also called musclewood. Really nice for shady areas. Alternate leaf dogwood, flowers, fruit, fall color, all very nice. And I didn't put flowering dogwood in because of the problem with anthracnose, the um, cornice florida really is getting hammered by the disease anthracnose. So just a few others that are um, not native to New York, but are native to the eastern United States for shade, the gold star. The, uh, there's a pachysandra that instead of planting Japanese pachysandra, 
why not plant the one that's native to Pennsylvania? It's not the leaves aren't nearly as um, glossy. I think it's a much more beautiful green. Neat flowers on it. Calacanthus, the sweet shrub native to the Appalachians. Father Gela, native to the Mid Atlantic region and the Pocosins. Oak leaf hydrangea, native to Tennessee and the Appalachians. Native to the Appalachians, the uh, evergreen drooping Lakothui. A red buckeye, native to the Appalachians, a really nice, one of the very best for butterflies and for hummingbirds. Eastern red bud, naturalized in New York State, uh, comes up into central Pennsylvania, it really does very nicely here. And then just to, for about any kind of site conditions, just a few I'll suggest. Switchgrass, which is a real good native, is being considered for biomass production. Panicum, a lot of neat horticultural varieties. Eastern nine bark, Physocarpus, a lot of really uh, striking horticultural varieties that have different kinds of leaf colors and and red maple, uh, found in the greatest number of forest types of any tree in the eastern United States. All right, then just a few, just to uh, give you a little bit idea of where we're going with some of our thinking here, um, for really, really acidic sites. Well, there's lots of species that occur in those sites because we we know from bogs, but tea berry, it's actually being sold even by places like Home Depot now selling containers of tea berry. The pinkster azalea, High bush blueberry, so I replaced the hedge along the side of my yard, although the soils are alkaline. I've got about 15 high bush blueberries that are now 15 years old. I just put sulfur down, nothing else than that, and I'm picking quarts and quarts of blueberries off my high bush blueberry every summer. Beautiful fall color. A high pH, this is the Alvar, northwest of Watertown and lots of high pH areas around central New York and many species well adapted like chinkapin oak lives for three to four hundred years. The northern white cedar will live for fifteen hundred years. And then sailing, we're wrapping up some work on looking at the uh, natural uh, inland salt marshes and some of the applications of those species to some brownfield restoration. So here's just an example of what one of those sites looked like outside of Syracuse in 1965 or so. That site doesn't exist anymore. And these sites had the spar tidal, all these species that occurred in the eastern coastal uh, ester and the, one, the ones that are tidal, these are the same species, but they occur inland in these non-tidal inland salt marshes, and they are really nice plants for highly saline environments. So here's an example on the Salvay waste beds. The pH is run from 8 to 12, and here's a natural population of prairie cordgrass, and it does even better when you get it off of a pH of 8 to 12. And we just discovered a bunch of populations of seaside goldenrod, solidago, sempervirens. Sempervirens meaning always green. And here it is along a roadside in Syracuse. Here it is along I-81 near Nedro, which is where the greatest salt application occurs in this corridor outside of Syracuse. And this whole stretch here, it's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of seaside goldenrod, eight feet tall, that the DOT cuts back about every year. Here's what the plant looks like in flower. Flowers a month later than the Canada goldenrod. It's a much more beautiful plant. Foliage is just striking. All right, so and if you don't have, if you've not seen this book, uh, it's either readily available. It covers all these species and, and more. All right, so I'll stop there. If there are any questions, uh, so I've got about two or three minutes till 12. Tell me what you, if I can do anything else for you, I'd be happy to try to help.